Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, Redfish 2023.3 uh, release webinar. Uh, my name is Jeff Otter with uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and I'm one of the Redfish Forum co-chairs. And with me is uh, Mike. Yep, I'm Mike Ranieri. I'm from Dell Technologies, and I'm the other Redfish Forum co-chair. And as I said, today we're here to uh, talk about the uh, the latest release of uh, of the Redfish uh, uh, materials. Uh, and this is uh, Redfish release uh, 2023.3 uh, that was uh, Made available. Uh, it went through our process at the end of uh, at the end of December and, and became available in the uh, in the middle of January publicly. Uh, and uh, let's let's uh, get right into it. So, as a summary summary of all the materials that were uh, released as part of this cycle, uh, we have a new revision of the Redfish uh, specification. That's version one point twenty. Uh, a few things that that caused that bump in in minor version uh, was uh, was adding a requirement uh, on the recently added outbound connections uh, using the WebSocket protocol. Uh, we have registered uh, an official uh, Redfish uh, protocol header. Uh, with uh, with uh, with is that the I Iana uh, with with the powers that be? So, uh, so we wanted to make that a requirement uh, uh, to to for interoperability. So that was uh, that was the major major change to the spec, uh, which is really just a, a a new requirement for for folks doing the WebSocket pieces. Uh, there was also a clarification uh, made uh, to state that. The services you know must or shall accept an empty uh, JSON action, a uh, JSON object when actions uh, are submitted, uh, even if the re the action doesn't have uh, any required parameters. This is for consistency with uh, with implementations on both the client and the service side. Uh, this was previously a, 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 just an allowed or a, a recommendation, uh, but because it was uh, difficult to make a client that would uh, that would work uh, with, without having to do some try fail semantics, which we want to avoid, uh, so we've just made that a requirement. So uh, th that is a change that would require a modification to an implementation if they if it wasn't uh, already doing this. And therefore, that uh, because the the releases are backward compatible, uh, you know, if you are uh, in order to report yourself as supporting the protocol version one point twenty, uh, you have to make that change. So uh, that's some something we've done very often. Uh, but again, it's a it's a fairly minor thing, and 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 if you can't support that, uh, well, just just make sure you're still reporting a a, a protocol version of you know prior to to one point twenty. Uh, in uh, in parallel with that uh, was a, an errata release of, of version 1.19, so that's version 1.19.1, uh, and a number of clarifications. And I'm not going to go through the these in, in excruciating detail, uh, but more, mostly clarifications around uh, URI construction uh, and the behaviors of uh, some of the uh, the query options uh, and the next link. Uh, if, if if for folks that are using uh, large uh, collections and and the Giving guidance for how you uh, how you return the the content of that uh, what that next link means and its and its uh, and its opaqueness uh, to the client. Uh, there was also uh, some uh, some additions made to uh, allow the configuration. And Michael will get into this too when we see the uh, when he goes through the schema additions. Uh, there was also uh, some uh, additions made to schema uh, to allow. Uh, configuration of, of of the usage of HTTP basic auth uh, and so we made uh, reference to those uh, in the uh, in in the specification that just references what's in the new schema so so those are the specification pieces I said it was there was a minor the minor vision where it was was needed to take those new requirements but other than that uh, uh, not not a not a lot of new functionality uh, but so almost a formality uh, in the uh, schema bundle uh, that, that that obviously is the major uh, reason for for any of our releases is, is additions to the schema uh, and uh, in the in the 2020.3 excuse me 2023.3 bundle uh, we have uh, one new schema uh, and called resolution step and Mike will go through that and there are 26 uh, updated schemas uh, and in a change to our previous webinar formats we're going to go through just the uh, just the the items that we think are, are germane for uh, the uh, a large group of folks uh, and if you really need to see all the details uh, the release notes in in DSP 8010 which is the schema bundle uh, will go through uh, all of those things in gory detail uh, if you download the present the overview presentation uh, version of this uh, of, of this webinar deck uh, you'll also see 
<clears throat> you also see uh, uh, the each of those uh, called out individually. Uh, the uh, so the schema bundle was the is the is the big reason to be here. Uh, the message registry bundle, uh, also version you know, 2023.3, uh, we added one new message uh, to the base messages registry, and I think we also had an errata that's going to come out in the next version that will correct uh, a, a little typo in that one. Uh, but that's that was just filling out uh, a a. a a message that was uh, missing uh, relative to to other things, uh, you know. So we had this uh, action parameter value out of range uh, was just a, one of the one of the variety of of action parameter uh, errors that uh, that just didn't have that coverage. And as always, all of the materials uh, released publicly from the Redfish Forum are available on the DMTF uh, Redfish Standards page. You know, dmtf.org/standards/redfish. So as part of the uh, as part of the release, we always update uh, <clears throat> the, the uh, uh, user uh, documentation for uh, for using the schemas and the registries. Uh, so there are four uh, <clears throat> guide documents. Uh, the uh, data model specification is what was previously called the Redfish Schema Supplement. This contains all of the normative language, you know, what shows up in, as quote quote long description uh, in the schema files. Uh, as well as the uh, the end user facing uh, you know user descriptions, uh, and this is intended for uh, both you know developers and end users. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, the uh, there's the the Redfish Resource and Schema Guide is a uh, a smaller version of that uh, that that has just the user facing documentation uh, and example payloads for all of those uh, resources. Uh, the message registry guide uh, does the same thing uh, for uh, the message registries, presenting all of those in a user-friendly format. Uh, and lastly, the Redfish property guide is an alphabetical list, basically an index uh, to all the properties uh, that are that go across all schemas. Uh, a feature that we added, uh, a few, I think, uh, two releases ago now, uh, is a is a new GitHub repository called Redfish Publications, uh, and you can see the link there. is It's it is under the DMTF organization on GitHub. Uh, this uh, this repository includes uh, read only copies, uh, but official copies of all of the Redfish schemas and the standard message registries. Uh, having this in a GitHub allows. Uh, folks to uh, synchronize their own uh, clones of the repo to, to to very easily keep up to date with all of the release materials. Uh, it also provides a, uh, a durable link uh, on the internet uh, for folks to make references to specific uh, schema files or particular lines if you need to call out something uh, in one of the schemas, especially a long description to explain to someone uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a bug report. Uh, and you can provide those, uh, those links and they will continue to work. Uh, and that repository is organized in the same manner uh, as the uh, the zip file of DSP 8010 uh, and the contents of uh, DSP 8011, uh, so you'll find the the uh, five uh, five different folders there with all of the uh, uh, with all of the schema files. And with that, I'm going to hand it to Mike to go through some of the details of the new schema. All right, thanks, Jeff. So uh, as we indicated earlier, we had one new schema file called Resolution Step. Uh, the intent of this is to give a, a, a programmatic interface for how to resolve an error or, or other type of fault with, with associated with, with messages. So the, the intent is if you look through log entries or you get events or you go through conditions on a resource and or just other messages that might appear in payloads, there can potentially be a resolution steps property, which is an array of objects that tells a user, you know, what type of uh, operation to perform to correct this entry. Is this the, the first, second, third, or, or nth uh, thing to try in the sequence of resolutions? Any URIs that are needed to, uh, to help uh, resolve the issue and uh, any types of retry po policies, like if, like maybe you'll take HTTP timeouts potentially or, or some other type of, um, uh, error condition in, in those uh, when resolving uh, the, the issue. So if we go to the next slide, we have an example of what this could look like. So we have a resolution step. It's This is part of a, a, a get response that's uh, in line with a, a status of a device. So we see here that the health of this device is critical. There is some condition uh, associated with it. We see that there's 
uh, too many fatal errors. So like think about PCAE fatal errors that could happen. Uh, and in here, we see that inside that conditions object, there's now resolution steps. So there's guidance for what you as a user may need to programmatically do to uh, to correct this action and uh, this uh, this type of uh, uh, this type of issue. And so the first step that's marked as priority zero says, well, it's going to be a reset of some type. And we give the action URI of where to invoke that reset and what type of resets that you need to invoke. In this case, it's a forced restart. Uh, and then if the issue still persists, there's a, a secondary step you could take. Uh, this is a more of a manual type of operation. So you need to go replace some hardware. So uh, replace uh, GPU three in this case. And then lastly, even after replacement, uh, the, the last uh, recommended resolution is to contact the vendor for additional support. All right, if we go to the next slide. So uh, going into the other types of uh, minor updates, uh, we, there's a handful of things that, we sh that we'd like to at least point out to, to users. Uh, first is in the account service, which correlates with uh, one of the, the additional changes in the register specification. There is a new HTTP basic auth uh, control property. This allows you to, uh, to configure um, uh, whether or not HTTP basic authorization is enabled. Or and uh, if you want it to be actively advertised. So one of the one of the things with um, basic auth is that when you don't provide valid credentials, you're supposed to advertise um, the basic auth capability with the www authenticate header. You could hide that. There there's some potential security concerns with advertising basic auth, but this gives you the full configuration with uh, whether or not you want to have it fully enabled enabled, but you don't want that advertisement or just completely disabled because you don't want to trust basic auth at all in your environment. Uh, the other change uh, coming up is with the drive resource, we added a new action called revert to original factory state. Uh, this was requested because there are capabilities on uh, self-encrypting drives to be able to recover them to an original state based on a physical secure ID. You would find that normally printed on the drive label itself. So maybe if you lost your encryption keys or you just want to reset the drive back to uh, back to some known state that uh, that originally came to you in from the, from the vendor, you would use this action to do that. Within log service, we added uh, a f uh, th these next two changes there, they go kind of, uh, go hand in hand. One is uh, when you're invoking uh, an operation to collect diagnostic data, uh, you can optionally provide a, a destination where you want that uh, diagnostic bundle to be pushed. So you could give it a, a URI username, password, and the type of transfer protocol. So, so if you go off and you want to collect diagnostic data on a on a device, you could say when you package up that that data not only do you attach it to the log entry that's associated with the action, but you could also say, I want you to transmit it to my remote capture server. Uh, likewise, the push diagnostic data action was added so that if you already have debug data captured and you don't want to collect new data again, you just want to, you just want to take that existing data attached to a log entry and push it to a remote server. You could, you could do that through this, this new action. And then lastly, in the processor schema, uh, there, there, was a, there was a request to add new RISC-V uh, architecture um, support. So adding in uh, RISC-V to the processor architecture and RV32 and RV64 to the instruction sets. Um, and that covers all the, uh, the minor changes that are worth highlighting. Uh, lastly, we do want to have a blurb about our our conformance tools. So still, we, we, we like to point folks to using the Redfish Protocol Validator, the Redfish Service Validator, and the Redfish Interop Validator as ways to test your service for different levels of conformance. The Protocol Validator testing the uh, more the HTTP handling and other uh, over-the-wire types of aspects of the Redfish service. So largely adhering to the, the Redfish Protocol, uh, Redfish specification. Um, the Redfish Service Validator tests the integrity of the payloads themselves to make sure they meet the schema definitions in the AD10 bundle. And then the, the Interop Validator is to test um, uh, your service against 
requirements described in a Redfish profile. And so that would be used by third parties like OCP or, uh, or, or potential uh, uh, purchases of equipment to say, do you meet my minimum Redfish criteria? Uh, we do have a new white paper published, uh, DSP 2068, that goes into a little more detail about these tools, in particular, how you can install them, run them, and start to go through uh, reports. Okay, uh, so that brings us to the end. Uh, now we have an open question and answer se uh, session. So if any folks have any questions they wanna ask us about the release three bundle, uh, this would be a good good time to, uh, to do that. Or if you uh, don't want to be part of the, uh, I don't want to have your questions recorded. We could we could save that for the uh, for the round table afterwards. Okay, so uh, don't see any questions coming up now, but if anyone uh, wants to get involved in Redfish, uh, for, first place to look for is the standards page at dmtf.org slash standards slash Redfish. We also have more of a educational page uh, uh, for, for developers of so going to redfish.dmtf.org to just get a quick view of the what's available for white papers, documentation, mock-ups, and other types of uh, interactive things. If you have questions and answers you want to ask about the standard or, or need guidance, uh, we have a public forum, so redfishforum.com. If you have feedback that you want to uh, provide to DMTF, we have our feedback portal. And then lastly, if if you're a part of a company that would like to join the DMTF, uh, uh, there's a link to join at dmtf.org slash standard slash SPMF. All right, so I'm still not seeing uh, any hands raised for questions, so uh, we'll give it another 15 seconds or so. <laughs> Yep, and just a reminder, we will uh, we will continue on with our uh, open roundtable discussion once the webinar is concluded. All right, not seeing any other brave hands show up. I think we will uh, we will call that a we will call that a session for today. Thank you all for attending. Yep, thank you all.